Hello, so this is a lecture on projections and coordinate systems for week four of Intro GIS at UMass Amherst. Um, first thing is that the reason that we have to deal with all of this stuff with projections and coordinate systems is because uh, we are dealing with a spheroidal <laughs> or a geoid shaped Earth. Um, if Earth was flat, then flat like your screen or flat like a map, then we wouldn't have any problems with converting, uh, projecting a flat surface onto another flat surface. Um, but as a spoiler, the Earth is not flat. So that is the source of all of, all of what we're talking about today and all of these questions of what to use for projections and coordinate systems. So to start with, anytime you have a map, anytime you go from a, a spheroidal object onto a flat surface, all maps are going to have some sort of coordinate system. And that coordinate system will have an origin, so basically a zero, zero point, um, someplace on the Earth. It's going to have units, so those units, most of the, the ones that we see most often are meters, or decimal degrees. Um, occasionally we see feet, but those three I would say are the most common ones uh, these days for, for most coordinate systems. So this unit of one, of two, of three um, could be one meter, it could be one degree, it could be one foot, it could be one of anything that you define, but those ones are common ones. And then the other thing that a coordinate system will have is a direction. So a direction in which we're counting, you know, one, two, three, um, and sort of two main, I guess, two main directions. So if this could be, the Y could be pointing north, um, but it doesn't have to be pointing north. Um, so one example of a coordinate system is a geographic coordinate system. Um, and in a geographic coordinate system, we typically use this convention in terms of our signing, um, where our zero point uh, is on the prime meridian, so at zero degree longitude. And our zero point in terms of south and north is at the equator, zero degrees latitude. And so where we are in Massachusetts, we would say that this is, uh, you know, roughly 41 degrees north, that's the positive sign, and roughly negative 71 degrees westing. Um, if we were in the Eastern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, then both of those numbers, Northing and Easting, would, would be positive. If we're in the Southern Hemisphere, then we would be Southing, so negative um, in that first position. Uh, if we're in, you know, the Southern part of South America, for example, then we would be both Southing and Westing, so both of our numbers would be negative. This is all relative to a zero, zero point at the intersection of the equator and the prime meridian. Um, and this is just those things on a map with some numbers associated with them. A geographic coordinate system is based on decimal degrees. So decimal degrees are not units of distance. They are units of angle, right? So we go from zero degrees to 30 degrees, right? That's an angle of 30 degrees, uh, we get our right angle up to 90 degrees north or negative 90 degrees south. But we can't go any more than that, or we don't by convention go any more than that, right? When you get over here, um, then you're just counting back down again. So 89 degrees north, 88, et cetera, until you get back down to zero. In terms of longitude, um, we typically think of that as a full circle going all the way around. So starting from the prime meridian and counting to po counting upward positive to 180 degrees easting. Um, but then we kind of stop there and switch direction because we count negative uh, westing also to 180 degrees, in that case, the negative direction of 180 degrees. So a geographic coordinate system, if we think about those um, pieces of origin, units, and direction, a geographic coordinate system has an origin, it's zero, zero point, is where latitude and longitude are both zero, so that's the intersection at the equator and the prime meridian. 
It has units always of degrees, so angular units, not distance units. And it has a direction um, such that uh, north um, basically is your positive direction in terms of uh, degrees latitude and east is your positive direction in terms of degrees longitude. So again, along those um, latitudinal and longitudinal lines are uh, account for our direction. Um, so again, these are the, the spherical coordinates. These are angular degree units. Um, so when we're measuring a position on the globe in a geographic coordinate system, they're going to be reported in degrees latitude, north or south of the equator, or and degrees longitude, so east and west of the prime meridian. Um, so those are no, those are referred to as spherical coordinates, right? Because they are angular units encompassing two circles <laughs> or lots of different circles um, around the Earth. Um, when you take that information of latitude and longitude from a geographic coordinate system and try to put it on a flat surface, um, there's really no way to do that. So a geographic coordinate system gives you coordinates, but it's not actually projected. So technically it's not a projection, although sometimes for shorthand, um, we talk about projections as synonymous with uh, coordinate systems. So these pieces of information are really important to just sort of keep in your head. And I, I've already said this, but I'm just gonna say it again. A geographic coordinate system, the units are always degrees. They are always um, some form of degrees measured in the directions of uh, longitude, easting and westing and latitude, northing and southing. When you go into ArcGIS, so we're gonna be playing around with some coordinate systems and properties and just kind of like digging around to, to find information about both spatial data as well as the, the map, so the project itself in ArcPro this week. Um, a lot of times discerning what the coordinate system is can be tricky because uh, ArcPro at least doesn't necessarily tell you when you're looking at the properties of the the uh, data file doesn't necessarily say this is a geographic coordinate system. It might instead just give you labels like this, WGS 84 or NAD 27, which are not coordinate systems. Those are actually datums, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later <laughs> because that's a whole, that's sort of a separate um, and, and often kind of confusing um, nomenclature that the GIS uses. So get comfortable with seeing those words because you're going to see a lot of words that refer to the datums and WGS 84, NAD 27, NAD 83. Um, that stands for, by the way, the World Geodetic Survey from 1984. That's our best approximation of the entire Earth as a spheroid. NAD 27 and NAD 83 are North American datums. And so they are our best approximation of minimizing distortion for North America um, using a particular shape uh, spheroid of the earth. So come back to that at the end of this lecture. So here's the projection process of basically what happens. So you start with the earth. The earth is not a sphere, right? Nor is the earth a spheroid. A spheroid is basically an ellipse, uh, you know, if, if a sphere, if a circle is to a sphere, then an ellipse is to a spheroid. Uh, so it can have slightly longer um, and shorter axes, but otherwise it is smooth. It is a smooth, smooth surface here. The earth is not a smooth, smooth surface, right? The earth has mountains and valleys and oceans and continents. Um, it has places where an elephant is standing in a puddle, right? That are going to change the surface shape from this nice smooth thing um, into something that is a little lumpy and bumpy. So the first thing that we do is because it's really hard to geometrically define. It's a lot of <laughs> super complex algebra that we don't wanna deal with. Um, to try to take all of those individual lumps and bumps, which are changing all the time on Earth, 
um, and go directly to a flat map. So instead what we do is we approximate this lumpy bumpy earth as this perfectly smooth spheroid. And that is the datum, that's the datum process. So we define this earth, uh, lumpy bumpy earth as a smooth spheroid using a particular datum. And the reference spheroid could be one that's, uh, per, that's uh, best suited for the entire world like the World Geodetic Survey from 1984, or it could be one that is best suited just for North America wherever that is on this reference spheroid. Um, and that might be the North American datum from 1983. There is actually a, a pretty recent update to the North American datum, I believe. Once we have this beautiful smooth surface spheroid to work with, we could stop there. Um, and then we're in a geographic coordinate system, right? We can just say, all right, I don't wanna try to measure my units in meters or feet or anything that's related to distance. I'm just gonna go with my angular units um, of decimal degrees around this spheroid and, uh, and I'm done. Or we could choose to try to take this spheroid shape and project it onto a flat map. Um, and so that is where we get into a projected coordinate system. So the PCS part where this is the GCS, the geographic coordinate system, here we get into a projected coordinate system. So if you are on a screen looking at a map, <laughs> then it is some form of projection has been used. Uh, so it could be um, that the whole map looks like a circle. That's what's called an azimuthal projection. It could be that it's sort of like an, uh, an unwound cone that's referred to as a conic projection. It could be that it's a, a rolled out cylinder. So that's commonly referred to as a cylindrical projection. These are the three most common map forms and let's, we'll get into those um, in a little bit more detail. So here are some projected coordinate systems that you might commonly see, or maybe some of these are less common <laughs> to see. Important things to know about a projected coordinate system, the units are never, never in degrees. So they could be in meters, they could be in feet, you could define them as the length of your pinky finger, any of those are possible in terms of a coordinate system, but they are not in angular units, they are in actual distance units. Um, the location of the origin depends on the projection. So some of them may have an origin, so a zero, zero point that is at the intersection of the equator and the prime meridian. Others may be in different places along the equator, you know, moving <laughs> along this. I, I don't know where the origin of this one is, of where it counts from, you know, it could be down here, it could be in the middle, who knows, we would have to actually open that one up um, in GIS to figure out where the zero zero points are of these various different global um, projected coordinate systems. So important piece, never in units of degrees, the origin could be anywhere, those are all defined independently based on the coordinate system. The direction of those units may also not necessarily, so in this one you can see that you know it looks like north and east are sort of the two main directions on here. This one's a little bit trickier, right? So where, where are we counting from in terms of direction on this one? Because there's not a consistent um, up, same thing on here, you know, where are we counting from um, in terms of our direction? They're not always necessarily north uh, and east. So those two main things, the geographic coordinate system and the projected coordinate system. One thing to bear in mind is that because geographic coordinates are angular units because they're decimal degrees and not units of distance, they do not represent equal distances in all the different directions. So this is, Mass this is the state of Massachusetts in a geographic coordinate system. And on this, uh, we just have a line <laughs> across the middle of Massachusetts and then a circle. And these are all uh, the size that they would be if they are displayed in a geographic coordinate system. And this is what it looks like if you change it to a projected coordinate system. So in this case, 
the units are uh, in meters because I wrote that at the bottom of the slide, but we don't necessarily know that they're in meters. Um, the units are in meters. That means it's a distance unit, right? So if I move a meter north, it's the same distance as if I move a meter east. That's different from this one. If I move a degree north, it's actually a different distance than if I move a degree east. And that's because our lines of latitude, right, are uh, 40, 42, or thereabouts in here for Massachusetts, they are parallel all the way up until you get to the poles, right? Um, so the distance between one degree at the equator from zero to one is the same distance as if you go from 89 to 90 degrees north right before you get to the pole. That's not true for degrees easting and westing. So longitude, if you can imagine, if you're on the equator and you take a giant step <laughs> one degree longitude, um, that's about 110 or thereabouts kilometers. But those lines of longitude as they're going towards the pole, they're getting closer and closer together, right? Until they actually meet at the pole. So if you were standing on the North Pole or real close to the North Pole, and I asked you to take a step a degree east, you could actually do it because <laughs> it's not 110 kilometers when you're standing on the pole, you're essentially standing on all of those degrees. So if you draw in a geographic coordinate system, a circle that is the same degree east as it is the same degree north, when you get that into a projected coordinate system, the units in meters, it actually is far fewer meters to go a degree east when we're up at 41 north than it is to go a degree north. All right. So uh, thinking about those different ways that we do, that we project uh, spheroids onto flat surfaces, um, cones and cylinders as well as flat pieces of paper, right, are things that are already flat. We have a much harder time if we're trying to just squish the, the spheroid. Um, we can also break it into a whole bunch of different pieces, but it's not a continuous surface. So, uh, so that's why cones, cylinders, and those flat pieces of paper that we refer to as azimuthal are some of the more common ways that, that spheroids are projected. So let's talk through each of those three things, cylinders, cones, and azimuthal, <laughs> a fancy but not intuitive name that essentially means smushing your globe onto a piece of paper. So what are the kind of trade-offs between those different things? And what are the things that we want to think about in terms of choosing uh, projections that are going to minimize distortion? Because this is a really key point in projections and coordinate systems, there's no way to get that globe onto a flat surface without distorting something. Something is always distorted. And what are the things that can be distorted? Distance can be distorted, right? So here's an example of one where distance is really distorted, right? These two things are actually right next to each other, <laughs> but it doesn't look that way, right? It looks like they're really far apart. Um, direction can be distorted. So, you know, sinusoidal is distorting direction a little bit, right? If I'm standing over here, then uh, north is in this direction. And if I'm standing over here, then north is in this other direction. Shape can be distorted. Uh, so I'm not sure which of these is good for looking at shape distortion, but certainly this one, um, our cylindrical projections are good at distorting shape and area. Um, they, they're really good at direction, though. They preserve direction no matter where you are on the Earth. So, uh, you know, Antarctica here is not as big as all of the other continents combined. It is not this particular, like, gigando shape. So shape area both distorted in this cylindrical projection, um, especially as you move more towards the poles. Uh, remember, uh, Greenland is about 1 14th the size of Africa, so definitely um, not the right shape or area in this projection. Um, 
The Mercator projection is probably the most famous uh, and the original example of a cylindrical projection. So this was, it's named the Mercator projection after a guy named Mercator. Um, and the reason that it was developed is because it preserves, especially preserves direction, um, but also shape, it looks like based on my notes on this slide. And the reason that those two things are important is because back in the 1500s, right, lots of Europeans where this guy was from um, were sailing around the world. And it's important to know that if you're looking at your map and you chart a direction to get from Europe to North America or Europe to India or wherever it is that you're trying to go, that you're sailing in the right direction. So this map preserves direction. It's also kind of nice to know that the, the shape of the coastline is gonna look on your map the way it's gonna look when you're actually looking out of your spyglass or whatever it is that you're checking out the continent with. So which parts of the earth look best in Mercator? Um, the way that we think about minimizing distortion is in terms of where that piece of paper, so in this case, the cylinder, where it intersects with the globe. So the cylinder here intersects with the globe at the equator, which means that all around the equator, so where's our equator? Down here-ish, <laughs> you know, that part is gonna be the least distorted. So it's gonna have the least distortion in terms of direction, in terms of distance, in terms of shape, in terms of area. And as you move away from wherever that intersection point is between your cylinder and your sphere, that's where you get the most distortion. So that's why Greenland looks gigundo over here. That's why uh, Antarctica looks enormous um, in a Mercator projection um, because you're essentially peeling apart uh, the earth and uh, spreading it, spreading a point that should be just a few, you know, like really these should all be really close to each other, right, in degrees longitude and putting them way further apart than they actually are. There's another common coordinate system, so another common projection that we see, which is known as transverse mercator. Um, we also see this referred to as universal transverse mercator or UTM for short. So if you see UTM, you will start to recognize that as a cylinder, a cylindrical projection turned on its side. So you can imagine that if in a standard mercator, you minimize, uh, you minimize distortion where the uh, piece of paper wraps around the globe at the equator. If you turn that cylinder on its side, then you minim minimize distortion along degrees of longitude. So, and you define, so UTM projections actually go all around the earth. It's like the cylinder boop, 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 moving all the way around the earth. Um, so that means that if you have an object that is more or less north south directionally, then a transverse mercator, a cylinder on its side is a good choice for minimizing distortion of the map features that you're showing because that cylinder intersects along a line of longitude. So here are just some zones for universal transverse mercator or UTM zones. They span the entire earth um, at, at every six degrees. So six decimal degrees or thereabouts, you have a new zone. So, um, you know, for Massachusetts, if we are in Western Mass, we might go with zone 18. If we're in Eastern Mass, we might go with zone 19 if we wanted to use uh, Mercator projection to minimize distortion along a line of longitude. Uh, another really common form of projections is the azimuthal projection. So an azimuthal projection is basically you have your sphere, boink, you put your piece of paper on top of that sphere. And there are a couple of different ways, actually there's a bunch of different ways. So orthographic, stereographic. Um, orthographic is one where you're essentially sort of bird's eye view. If you imagined you were a bird sitting on the moon, <laughs> then uh, whatever you saw of the earth would be um, an example of an orthographic projection. Stereographic projection is one where 
Uh, if you imagined you had a light and you stuck it on the South Pole or any place on Earth and then cast it out so you could actually in some cases see beyond you know what your bird on the moon would definitely not see down to the equator kind of thing so you see a little bit more um, and if you look at these two maps I'll go back again you can see that you know depending on how you choose to do your azimuthal projection you might get uh, less or more of the actual globe um, presented in it so when do we typically see azimuthal projections? Most typically, this is when we're looking at a whole, either a hemisphere of the Earth or when we're looking at the poles. Um, you know, the poles are kind of a special region in that for, you know, most of the things that humans tend to care about and put on maps are not so much on the poles. And so uh, if we use any of these standard projections like a Mercator projection or some of the other cylinders that we're getting to in a second, the poles get pretty wonky, right? They're like way on the edge. So if you wanted to focus on a pole, um, then the most standard way to do that is with some sort of azimuthal projection. You know it's an azimuthal projection anytime you see a map that's a circle. Because if you imagine you're a bird sitting on the moon, looking at the earth, it looks flat to you, but it looks like a flat circle, right? Um, you just can't see, <laughs> you can't see beyond it. The other time when we commonly see azimuthal projections are when we're looking at maps of other planets or of other moons or our moon. So if you ever see a map of the moon or a map of Mars or a map of Mercury or something like that, it will typically be in an azimuthal projection so that you see an entire hemisphere, um, which means that that map has a fair bit of map distortion on it, right? So as you get to the edges here, things are starting to look pretty distorted, um, but that we don't usually notice that too much when we're looking at a map of Mars because we don't think of it in any other way than in an azimuthal projection. And then the third one, so we talked about cylindrical as well as the transverse cylindrical, the transverse mercator, talked about azimuthal. Third most common one is a conic projection. So this is essentially where you create sort of a dunce cap and you put it on top of your spheroid. Um, so there are different conic projections. So Albers equal area conic is one example. A Lambert conformal conic is another one. The names of these give you some clues as to what is not distorted in the map. So Albers equal area conic is a common projection that is used to display North America. Um, and what is preserved in an Albers equal area conic? area is preserved, area is equal in all of these. So if I drew, uh, you know, kilometer by kilometer square, anywhere on this map, I would still be measuring a square kilometer. It doesn't matter where I am. Lambert's conformal conic is another uh, example of a commonly used conic projection, also um, commonly used to display North America. Conformal is another word for preserving shape. So shape is preserved anytime you see the word conformal, but not necessarily any of the other map properties. Um, as a point of interest, MassGIS uses Lambert conformal conic. So that is the Massachusetts state plane coordinate system is a Lambert conformal conic projection, which means that Massachusetts cares most or has made the choice to care the most about preserving shape of everything. Um, because we're relatively small compared to the entire Earth, the other bits don't get distorted too much. So area, um, distance, direction are not going to be terribly distorted. But the thing that is definitely preserved is shape for uh, the Massachusetts state plane coordinate system. Uh, here is what a cone might look like if you were to um, unroll it for the entirety of the earth. Um, and some of you might have seen this 
in like lab one when we were playing around with some mass GIS data layers, if you zoomed all the way out to the entire globe, you might have seen, I don't think it looked quite like this pie slice. I think it actually looked more like a pie missing a slice, um, but that was a cone unrolled for the entire earth. So when do we wanna use a conic projection? Remembering again, and I'll go back a couple of slides to this one, remembering that the areas that have minimized distortion are the areas where your piece of paper, in this case, the cone, intersects with your globe. So cones in, can intersect with the globe uh, along one line of longitude, or in this case, they can intersect, they can actually like go kind of underneath the Earth's surface and intersect along two lines of longitude, which means that the, the least distorted parts of our map are wherever my cone, let's say it's along this line of longitude, wherever my cone intersects with my globe, that's gonna be the least distorted. And as I move away from that, either in this direction or in this direction, that looks pretty huge huge, right, South America down there, then things start to get more and more distorted, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, if my cone is intersecting here, things are starting to look a little wonky as I go towards the North Pole, things are definitely looking pretty wonky as I'm going towards the South Pole. So, recap, if you use a cylindrical projection, the cylinder can either intersect with the equator and a standard Mercator projection or it can intersect with a line of longitude in a universal transverse mercator. So if you have a feature that is mostly north to south, like for example, the state of California, then you are more likely to reduce distortion if you use a, a projection like universal transverse mercator where the piece of paper, the cylinder intersects along a line of longitude. If you are trying to represent a pole or a hemisphere, azimuthal is the way to go. If you are trying to represent uh, an area that is more east-west, so it's uh, spread out east-west, like for example, the state of Massachusetts or the state of Tennessee <laughs> or something like that, then a conic projection is probably more suited for that because a conic projection extends, reduces distortion along a line of latitude. So going easting and westing, right? So those were our three main types of map projections. So when we get into ArcGIS, the nice thing is that for the most part, with the exception of this week in lab, uh, and hopefully you don't, <laughs> hopefully rarely outside of that, you mostly don't even have to worry about projections. And the reason behind that is that ArcGIS can do a thing that's called reprojecting on the fly. That is, you could have 10 different spatial data layers and they could come from, they could have 10 different projections, including a lack of projection. Some of them could be geographic coordinate systems. The rest of them could be projected coordinate systems of all different types. And Arc Pro, because it has all of those projections built into its library, knows the geometry of how to translate one of them to the other. So you could have 10 different projections in your data files. You can make your map, so the actual project map, a totally different projection. And Arc will still be able to put all of those in the right place as long as <laughs> everything is defined correctly, right? If you have something that's undefined, the projection is undefined, or you have defined the projection incorrectly, like you've told ARC, it's this, but it's actually this. Um, as long as those two, as long as those problems aren't there, everything's gonna be fine. And you may never have to even worry or think or know anything about projections again. But it's important, to have this little flag out there that projections could matter <laughs> because they can uh, sometimes really mess up your stuff later on. Um, and, you know, occasionally, at least in past years, there are occasional bugs uh, in the ArcGIS system that, uh, that don't like it when you are using, for example, a geographic coordinate system with units of degrees and you ask Arc to calculate distance or area in units of meters, art can sometimes get a little salty about doing things like that. 
All right. So again, the only times that you're likely to run into trouble and guess what? In lab this week, we're going to create that trouble for you. Lucky you. <laughs> so the only times that you're going to run into trouble in terms of ArcGIS, not knowing where to put, you know, how to align data layers uh, is if you have spatial data with different projections or different coordinate systems, but those projections, one or more of those projections is not defined, or if your projections are incorrectly defined. So in lab this week, some of the fun of problem solving and troubleshooting is figuring out what's the right projection or coordinate system for this data layer and how do I define it correctly so that it actually shows up in the right spot with the rest of my data. Once it's showing up in the right spot, everything is good from there and off you go. All right, so where do we find this type of information <laughs> in, uh, in ARC Pro? Um, where do I go to learn more about coordinate systems, both of my data and of the map? So if you're thinking, if you have a specific piece of data, you've brought it into your content in ARC, the place to go is to the source. And the way you get there is to right click on your data layer, um, go to its properties, so it's all the way down at the bottom, and then you can look at this source mm, tab, I'll call it a tab, even though it's not really a tab, um, the source panel in this set of options. So this is from a data layer where I deleted the projection information and I handily called it no projection. You can see down here that the spatial reference says it's an unknown coordinate system. If you bring a data layer that has no coordinate system into your arc, uh, into your project, like onto your map, there a little error thing is gonna pop up. It's not really an error, it's just like a warning. A little blue warning box will pop up and it will say warning, <laughs> no coordinate system in this particular data layer. Um, but it still has, coordinates. So this is still spatial data. I just happened to delete the projection from it. So we have these giant numbers, like the top of this particular data layer. This is Townsend, Massachusetts. Is it 959,747? The bottom is at 777,514, et cetera, for uh, Westing and Easting. ARC actually says degrees for all of these, but they're not degrees. This is just arc. I don't know why it says degrees there. It should say unknown or question mark or something like that um, in this space. All right, so if I look at these, I guess this would be what, I guess we'll come back to this, but when I look at these, the first thing I ask myself is, is it a geographic coordinate system? Because if it's a geographic coordinate system, then my job is pretty easy. All I have to do is to decide what, you know, what datum, does it matter <laughs> first? What datum do I wanna pick to define, um, define my data layer? And off I go in terms of defining it as a geographic coordinate system in units of decimal degrees. But I know by looking at this, I can tell that these are not units of decimal degrees because this number is way bigger than 90. And this number is uh, like not even close to negative 90 <laughs> within those realms. This number is way bigger. Both of these numbers are way bigger than any range between negative 180 and 180. So I know that this is not a geographic coordinate system. I don't know what coordinate system it is. It's some sort of projected coordinate system because those are clearly not decimal degrees but it could be one of a million different things in terms of a projected coordinate system. So it's just that first piece of information that I want to you know, get in my head of, okay, it's not a geographic coordinate system. That means my job is not super easy here. That means I'm gonna have to do more digging around uh, to figure out what the correct coordinate system is. But that's where you find this information is in the source tab. And if down here, it says something that is not unknown coordinate system, then you can trust that this is going to say blah, blah, blah in units of meters or, you know, negative 180 to 180 in units of degrees or something like that. What about the map? So if you have a map uh, and you right click on the thing that says 
map <laughs> in your contents, or in this case, I change it to my mapity map. So that's uh, the name of this particular map. Uh, you can go to a coordinate systems tab uh, in here and look at what the current um, coordinate system is for that particular map project. So this is a North American Albers equal area. It's a conic projection. So that means it's a projected coordinate system. You can also, you can change it to whatever you want. So you can go through the millions of things that are in this geographic coordinate system and projected coordinate system and pick your favorite uh, or many favorites and just kind of go around and see what those different things look like. Another nice thing is that this highlighted one, there is a layers uh, option in here. So if you have 10 data layers in your contents and those 10 data layers are all coming for, all have different coordinate systems, you could expand this and change between the native coordinate systems of your different data layers. And if you're not really sure what this thing is, <laughs> you know, like up here of, you know, in this case, the NAD 1983 state plane for Massachusetts, you can always click on details up here to look a little bit more. Um, and in this case, it tells us, okay, this is a Lambert conformal conic projection. Remember that was the one that's the state plane of Massachusetts, that the units are in meters. And then it has a bunch of details of, for example, where the cylinder intersects with the sphere um, and you know, getting away from my, this is related to where the zero zero point is. The other piece of information is that it says all of this is built on top of this geographic coordinate system, which uh, is based on the NAD 1983 datum. So the datum, <laughs> final piece of information. Um, the datum is important because the Earth is not a perfect spheroid, right? It's not that nice, nice smooth surface. Uh, the Earth is a little bit pudgy, in fact. So the Earth is a little bit wider around the middle um, than it is going uh, north and south to the poles. It also has these things like giant mountain ranges and oceans relative to continents, which are different elevations. It depends a lot where you are in the world, how far away you are from the equator. So you can imagine if you're standing on the top of Mount Everest, wherever that is, then you're gonna be further away from the equator than if you are standing you know, in the coastline of the Mediterranean over here, right? Um, here, you're gonna be a little bit closer to the equator. Relative to the distance from the surface of the earth to, sorry, I didn't mean to say the equator, the center of the earth is what I was meaning to say. So relative to the distance between the center of the earth and the earth's surface, the difference between standing on the coast of the Mediterranean and standing on the top of Mount Everest is actually pretty small. You know, like it's a few extra kilometers on top of thousands of kilometers, right? So the, the, it's not a huge difference. Um, but if you wanted to get a really nice image of the, uh, you know, India and the Himalayas, then you would probably want to use a different datum than one that is designed for, uh, you know, Australia, which is flatter, <laughs> closer to the center of the Earth. So basically, what the datum does is it gets two major two axes: a major axis and a minor axis, and it defines the distance of these. So in this case, six thousand three hundred seventy-eight kilometers, point one three seven kilometers. Uh, is this one for the World Geodetic Survey from 1984. This is the best approximation for the entire Earth as a whole. The entire Earth on average <laughs> is about 6,378 uh, kilometers away from the center of the Earth. Um, the entire, like the poles on average, I guess, are about 6,356 kilometers away from the center of the Earth. So, but so what this spheroid does is it smooths out all of those lumps and bumps associated with um, all of those mountains and valleys and elephants and whatever else is going on in there. Um, example datums, I mentioned some of these at the beginning. WGS84 is the World Geodetic System. That's a common one that you'll see. NAD27, anything starting in NAD, 
is something that's pretty standard in North America in the US. So those are North American datums. Um, the datum, again, is not a coordinate system. The datum is not a projection. The datum is just defining the pudgy Earth as a smooth spheroid upon which we could then layer a projection or layer a coordinate system. Um, if you pick the wrong datum, how much does it matter? <laughs> the answer is it depends on the question that you are asking, right? So if I, uh, if I care generally that I want to get in the ballpark, you know, area, I want to get within like a few meters of whatever the object is, then probably choosing the wrong datum. So that wrong means the data were collected using WGS84 and you tell GIS to show this using NAD27, right? The difference between those two things is probably gonna put you off by a couple of meters. If you are trying to create Mike's Maze in Sunderland using precision GPS technology, being off on your datum between your map uh, coordinates of where you are sending your tractor or whatever it is, or your seed. I don't even know if they do that by mowing after the fact or if they just like seed in the corn um, in the particular pattern to begin with. Um, then being off by a couple meters matters, right? Because you're gonna screw up your entire, you know, picture that you're trying to draw in your corn maze. So if you need precision that is, you know, on the order of tens of meters or larger than that, then probably the datum doesn't matter too much. And you can just go with a reasonable one, like the data were collected in North America, let's go with a North American data. Um, if you need really high precision though, you should go ask whoever collected the data or see if you can find some metadata online, wherever you downloaded those data from to tell you exactly what datum was used when collecting that information. All right, so I just wanna finish up by looking at a couple of screen captures of data that have undefined projections. So again, down here, unknown coordinate systems. Um, and so here's a question, what are the units of this particular coordinate system? So hopefully if you paused or had a little think about that, the first thing that you would notice is that these are pretty small numbers and they go between approximately negative 90 and positive 90, they go between exactly negative 180 and positive 180. So even though I have not defined this projection or that this coordinate system in GIS, I can see by looking at it that this is a geographic coordinate system. And the reason that I know it's a geographic coordinate system is because these units are clearly degrees. It says degrees, but don't pay attention to that. That's just arc trying to mess with you. <laughs> but I can see that they are degrees because they are small numbers between negative 90 and 90, between negative 180 and 180. So I can tell that this is a geographic coordinate system. All right, so here's another one. And the question is, is this a geographic coordinate system or a projected coordinate system? All right, and so hopefully after looking at these numbers and thinking about that for a second, you can see that these numbers are way too big to be decimal degrees, right? They are way beyond 90 and negative 90. They are way beyond negative 180 and positive 180. And even though ARC says degrees over here, <laughs> you say, no, no, ARC, I can tell uh, that you are messing with me here and that these are some units of distance. So they could be meters, they could be feet, they could be the length of my pinky finger. We don't know. Um, and the way that we find out in those is uh, not. So if you determine by looking at this, that this is a projected coordinate system, you should not be guessing. Do not guess <laughs> a projected coordinate system. It could be anything. Um, you might be able to make some educated guesses, like if it's data that look like they came from mass GIS and the projection disappeared, maybe it's mass state plane. You know, if they're from 
California, maybe it's a California state plane, for example, like there might be some educated guesses, but generally do not guess. What you would wanna do in this case is go back to the website of wherever you downloaded these data and look for information about what the coordinate system is. If you can't find it there, that's bad <laughs> database management. Uh, then email somebody and ask them, can't find the coordinate system. Can you tell me what the coordinate system is supposed to be for these data? Occasionally, along with the data, when you download it, there might be like a text file or a Word doc or something like that that gives you metadata that will tell you this is a such and such coordinate system. And then you can go ahead and define it correctly. You're going to be doing some of that in lab today. Uh, or maybe not today, later this week. So this week in lab, we are dealing entirely with projections. And I just wanted to put a note out there that if you're watching this video before lab or while you're doing the, the lab questions, that there are conceptual questions throughout the lab. Um, I think they're highlighted in red. Those are part of what you need to turn in. That's only happening this week with, with lab four, with the projections lab but um, make sure you're writing down the answers to those so that you can turn them in at the end. All right, enough from me. I will see you in lab this week.